Welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to Textiles and Tea by the Ham Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I am the Advertising and Marketing Manager for HGA. Today's program is sponsored by Laurel Schwartz. Colorful and distinctive handmade jewelry. I encourage you all to go to her website and see her work. It's truly pretty. Um, today we will have um, We'll be talking for about 45 minutes or so, and then the last 15 minutes we'll take questions. So please use the Q&A button. Um, when you have a question, just write it in there. In the last 15 minutes, we'll try to answer as many as we can. Uh, we have a lot, um, but we'll get to as many of them as we can today. Today, I'm very excited. Um, we have Peggy Wiedemann here today. She is a basketry artist. Peggy went to the University of California in Los Angeles, where she was a fine arts major, but she studied um, painting and drawing until she found baskets, and then she was hooked, and she went over to basketry. Um, she says she enjoys using the fine materials, the natural materials, and really enjoys going to find those on her own. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more from Peggy today. Hi, Peggy. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. It's good to have you here. Oh, well, it's good to be here. Okay, our number one question when we start is, what is your favorite tea? Okay, well, I'm not a big tea drinker, but I, I'm not a big hot tea drinker, but I do like iced tea. So I do make sun tea and I like that. And I, what I like about it is, you know, you just put it in a big jar or pitcher and then throw any kind of tea bag you want in or an assortment thereof and put it out in the sun and it makes it for you. So. Oh, good sun tea, yes. Yeah, yeah, so. <laughs> and after it's done, you just put it in the refrigerator, it's ready to go, and you can add whatever you want to it. Well, let me ask you this, to, to kind of introduce yourself to everyone, tell us a little bit about um, how you got into basketry. Well, um, like you said, when I was at UCLA, I was in fine arts in, and uh, painting and drawing. And I really liked painting. I thought, that, oh, you know, that's really, really great. But I did other things too, um, photography and um, ceramic sculpture, you know, branched off to different things. I think you're always trying different things when you're an artist, but I'm a late bloomer. So I didn't <laughs> really make a basket until after I was 50 years old. And then it was just like, oh, wow, I finally figured out what I wanted to be when I grew up. So now I'm a basket maker fiber artist and loving every minute of it. Well, let me jump right into this because you classify yourself as a basketry maker, but a lot of her, your baskets do not look like baskets. They are, <laughs> they're very unique and distinctive. How did that come about? Ah, uh, good question. Um, well, it helps to be a little crazy and then come out differently. But I think it's because, um, I don't know, I guess I had a lot of uh, good experiences along the way. And when I found basketry, um, I also was really lucky to find a couple of basket guilds in my area, which I had no idea that were, they were there before. And uh, in the basket guilds, you have people making different kinds of baskets, you know, all kinds of baskets. Uh, and again, there were two. One was the Misty, is the Misty Washington Gordon Basket Guild, what's in the San Diego area. And the mm -hmm. other one was the LA Basketry Guild in the LA area. So all those people, you, you go to meetings and they're all making different things. And it's really, um, I don't know, it's just really stimulating. You know, you see all these different things, you see different materials. And then those guilds have people in the guilds that are teaching classes. And then they even bring in teachers from other places or have conferences or get togethers. And so you're seeing all this stuff going around. And I know for me, I just became a complete classaholic. I mean, if there was a class, I took it, you know, I, I wove, I, um, you know, did all sorts of different kinds of things and made different kinds of baskets. And I really liked that because it gave me a real appreciation for the whole process of basket making mm -hmm. not just the making and so many different kinds of weaving twining twill 
whatever, but so many different things that you can put in a basket that you can use to make the basket. And then of course, making the basket, it's all different techniques. And then there's a lot that goes behind it too. The materials you're gonna put it in and there's a lot of time involved um, gathering those materials. So of course I had to try everything, but I kept coming back to coiling. And that's what I do, I do coiling. And the first thing that I coiled with was pine needles. So I do use still a lot of pine needles in my coiling. And I think what I, the reason I came back to coiling is because it's a real slow process. Like if I'm starting a basket in the morning, it's not gonna be finished by the end of the day or maybe next week or next month, it's gonna, you know, it takes time. But when you're doing it and you're coiling and you're going around, going around, it's, it's kind of becomes this, I don't know, they say you're in the zone or whatever, but you're, you're there thinking about it and you're, you're calm and you know you're not gonna finish it. You're not in a hurry. You're just sitting there with yourself and the materials. And as you're doing that, different ideas come through to you. And I mean, I can make a basket that is a basket, but for me, as I'm going along, I'm thinking about what I'm making, but I'm also thinking about other things. And I love to experiment and just try different things. And you're right, they don't look like baskets. They don't hold anything. <laughs> They're of no use whatsoever. I except say that. Not fun to make. <laughs> well, let me ask you this question then. Um, because you were a painter, how uh, do you think starting out with paint and painterly and the drawing uh -huh. impacted on the basket making? Or do you think it had any relationship at all? Oh, no, I think it did, definitely. Uh -huh. I think anything that you do or any experience in your life, it, it has, it goes on and influence you, influences you, excuse me, uh, in your life and in other things that you do. But I think the painting, when I painted, and I still find myself doing it in basketry, um, I would look at, you know, the positive space and the negative space. Oh, oh And okay. the negative space was always really important to me. And um, a lot of people maybe don't look at things that way. But it's the idea that you look at a tree and you see maybe the tree without leaves and you're seeing that outline of the tree. But you're also seeing a lot of shapes and things in between those branches. And those are shapes and that's that, that negative shapes. And I always worked with those when I was painting. And I think I also worked with um, movement in my painting or a certain, um, not mean everything was moving in the painting, but kind of a certain energy. Everything uh -huh. has a certain energy, a certain thing around it. You know, you're moving the air or whatever. And I, I did that a lot in my painting. And I, I think I do a lot of that in my basketry too. So that probably leads me to some of those weird shapes and things. I love that whole positive negative. Yeah, that's great. And I never thought about it in terms of basketry, but yes, what a great connection that is. Yeah. Well, um, one thing I always wanna ask people is talk a little bit about your process versus product. Is okay. one more important to you? Do you think they're related in any way? Talk some about that if you would. Um, for me, I think the process is a lot more important okay. because that's what I really like to do. I really like to get in my studio and, and start working and making it, mm -hmm. you know, making whatever I'm making. And the way I work is I always start with an idea, but it seems to change along the way. And oh, really? that really makes it exciting. Or sometimes I'll start a piece and I have no idea how I'm going to finish it because I've just never done that before. But, you know, it, it comes together. And that to me is the fun part of it. You know, once it's done, it's done. But even saying that, the fun part for me is making it. But even when it's done, you know, after you've made a piece, sometimes that does affect your process because you look at it and you think, well, gee, that's interesting but what if I did this or I changed this oh, right. or, or use that idea and went more forward with it? So I think they're both important. That's great. Okay, um, I think in any kind of um, 
handcraft, craftsmen, there's always the issue of art versus craft. So on the continuum, where do you see yourself? Craftsman, artist, hobbyist, or do you find that you go back and forth where there is a time in your life you were one and now you're another? Tell me your views on those, if you would, please. Well, I, I guess I'm kind of funny because I, I think of myself as an artist. Mm -hmm. And the whole time that I was growing up and I, I grew up with art, you know, around me and I had a little bit of talent. So I was doing art all the time, but I never really made a distinction between artists, art and craft or artists and craftsperson. You know, they, they both are working together. And so to me, it was all art. Everything was art. And um, I, to me, you know, craft and or painting or some kind of craft of weaving whatever you're doing it's coming from your heart it's very personal so to me it's art and i know i had um being having been a painter i had one painter tell me one time that well paintings were art because paintings hang on the wall and they don't do anything and you know the rest if it does something it's not art but I don't think that's true. I really don't. I think, uh, you know, I make a lot of art that can hang on the wall and it doesn't do anything either. So I must be an artist. And I think craftspeople are artists because they make beautiful things. And then you, you asked me about hobby. Well, I think just cause you're a brain surgeon or something and you're really busy still, if you, you're making something, you like to paint or whatever, as a release or something you enjoy doing, you still end up making art, so. Well, we've put up the party dress. Right. <laughs> I think it really speaks to all the things you've talked about so far. So tell us a little bit about this work, if you don't mind. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> well, um, you see that there's a coat hanger there and I was at a swap meet and I bought a couple of coat hangers because I thought they were interesting. So of course I had to use them and this is all coiling and it's with um, Pakistani grass and some rag cordage that's from India and of course pine needles. And um, I just had the idea from the coat hanger. I guess that was my inspiration. So I started making it and um, I actually made one before this and it was gonna be small and that one was flat. It just, you know, went up against the wall. And that one was going to be very small and it ended up bigger than I am. And I'm five two, so it's pretty big. Um, and then I sent that one to my photogra photographer and she, took, she, I always send her a picture first. So she knows what's coming because I have to mail it to her. And uh, I sent her the picture and she goes, oh, I'm going to get a model and she's going to wear the dress and everything. And I'm going, no, 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 no. You, you can't do that, Jan. It's flat. Nobody can wear that. So she gave me this idea of making a three-dimensional dress after I had made that one. And of course, I had my second coat hanger. So then I made this. There you go. And, um, and it is three-dimensional. It has, you know, front and back and can go around. You can walk around it. So um, I even thought of this one at one time when I was maybe partway through that maybe I could just wear it for a moment just to send it to my friend. <laughs> but uh, if you've ever, you just cannot wear something made out of pine needles, it hurts. So I never yeah. did that. Now people are asking if this is one piece, I'm assuming it's parts put together. Yes, it is part put together. It's a whole bunch of different parts. Um, I started more at the top and then went down. And um, yeah, so it, it is definitely put together. There are some parts uh, that look like they could be pieces that are maybe one part because they're changing color or the color of the uh, cordage. But then there's also pieces, especially around the bottom where you see those loops, they're pieces. And then I put them together or I would, especially at the bottom, I would put a really large piece under that. Um, so, Yes, there's definitely more than one piece. Well, you, you've talked about you've got this love for the pine needles, um, mm -hmm. but are there other factors involved when you go to choose what you're working with or do you just work with pine needles? 
oh no, I don't just work with pine needles. And this is a good example because can't really tell in the picture, but there are pine needles. Um, there's a grass um, rope, it's called mm -hmm. Pakistani grass. And then this uh, cordage um, comes from India and it's basically rags that are put together to make cordage or to make rope. And that's what's in it. So there's more than just pine needles in it. And as I go along and as I have gone along, I've added probably more color to the pine needles than I originally started with. Because when I originally started, I was more into shapes and no color. And now I've added more color. And then um, I love to go to like swap meets and garage sales. And sometimes I'll just pick up something and that becomes part of the piece. And it could be, you know, metal or wheels or who knows what you, you pick up or a piece of fabric or you just, I have a studio uh, full of, for better words, stuff. Stuff in jars, stuff in baskets, stuff hanging around that maybe will become part of the piece someday. Because you can throw anything in there really. Yeah, you dye the, the uh, material yourself or you buy it dyed? Okay, yeah, I, I do collect my own pine needles. Right. And I've collected other things that are natural materials that are, <clears throat> that I can find in my area. Because a lot of, uh, I think a lot of basket makers, they, they choose their materials from where they live, what they can collect, what they can get easily. And that's what I've done. But I, I've used palm and fluorescence and grasses and just a lot of different things. And, and then in my days when I was, you know, and taking all sorts of classes and I still like taking classes when I can. And, you know, I've used other, other things that I can't find here like um, willow and cedar and things like that, that I, when I take your classes with other people. And then I come home with, you know, a bunch of that and that goes in my studio waiting to be used too. So. Um, well, I've, I've changed the combination of, of finding things that you like that you can buy and then also going out in nature and finding things you can use. Okay. I, now, if you notice, I've changed images because you were talking about how you don't just do the colorful, you also do the natural. Can you talk some mm -hmm. about this piece? Okay. Well, this piece is mostly pine needles. Mm -hmm. um, and it has the sticks and everything going up the side. Um, this came about because I went to a garage sale and I found these really interesting, you see the sticks going up the side and it was a man and he was selling a toy that somebody had made him when he was a kid. And it was a, a, a couple oxen with a yoke. And then this was part of a, so it was supposed to be um, a plow that was behind it, these sticks. Really? Yes. <laughs> and, and they've got metal on them and you can see how they're put together. They're really interesting. You can move them. And I thought, man, those are so cool. So I, I let him keep the oxen, but I, I bought the sticks from him. And that was somewhat the inspiration. And then um, I guess the challenge was getting it to, you know, go up like that. Mm -hmm. And so all the part that you see that's like a vessel, that's all... Uh, pine needles. And even the parts where you see are black, that there's still, there's pine needles inside of there. I've wrapped them with the uh, wax linen thread. And that's what I've used on that and probably all my pieces. I really love four ply wax linen thread. So, so what's the, what's the dimensions on this piece? People are asking. Ooh. Well, probably. I mean, is it like three feet tall, three inches tall? No, 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 it's not three feet tall. It's more like maybe a foot tall. It's not that big. Okay, okay. That's close. That's close. Remember, this was a toy plow, not a real one. Okay. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. Let's get that straight. <clears throat> um, if we can go to the next one. <clears throat> the next piece we're going to talk about is called Joy. Uh huh. Now, I picked this one because of the balance. I love, and I see that in your work. It's very balanced. Even when it's not asymmetrical or symmetrical, it's balanced. Can you talk some about this piece? 
Um, well, this is, um, it's an interesting piece only because of how it came about. Um, you know, sometimes you'll make a piece and you've worked on it and you've really enjoyed making the piece, but when you're finished, you just kind of go, oh. So this was one of those pieces that oh. I was not 100% happy with. Oh. Well, wait a minute, because, no, because um, right when I was beginning doing this, I, I had a, a, a piece that I sent, I sent to someone, we were trading it, and there was a gourd was part of the piece. And they must have dropped the television set, set or something on that package, and they broke it. They broke, and that was the first time that that had happened to me. And so when I got the piece back, I was so upset because it was broken and I had spent all this time weaving on it. Plus a friend had given me this, this board that was part of it that was really unusual, really an unusual board. So it was in my studio and oh, it just, it just made me upset every time I looked at it. So finally, uh, one day I got out my scissors and I just cut that old gourd off of there and got rid of it. And it sounds crazy, but it was a really liberating experience because I just throw the part I didn't like in the trash can and said to heck with it. And then I had quite a large piece uh, after that that I could weave on. In fact, I think I cut it in, I think I made three different pieces from the parts of that <laughs> with my scissors. And this came about by that because after I did that, I felt much more free if I, if I didn't like something you know, and it's sitting in my studio and I'm looking at it, that I can take it apart and start over. So this is maybe three quarters of a piece. And then I just added to it. And I like this one much better than the first one. I'm still working on the other half. Well, so to get some time. <laughs> It's just, it's wonderful to hear the story behind the piece. I mean, I just liked it because of the balance of it. <laughs> whole life to it. Um, and somebody else asked, speaking of life, they asked, do you find that your work talks to you as you start working on it or as you begin or at any point in time? Yes, I'm afraid so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's we why have I'm in my studio, you know, because it, I'm the only one there and I can can talk to me, I can talk to it, I can use whatever kind of words I want, and it's a lot cheaper than a psychiatrist. But uh, yes, it does, and a lot of times, and that's what I find with materials, any kind of material, but especially natural material. Sometimes you're going along and you have this vision and it's like, okay, we're going this way, and your materials just jump up in your face and go, uh, and you're in your wildest dreams. No, babe, we're not going that way. Right, mm -hmm. right. No. <laughs> and so sometimes you have to follow them. They know better than you do. Ah. Because every time I don't follow them and something ends up breaking their, you know, they were right. I shouldn't have gone that way. So I do listen to the materials. I think the materials, the texture and everything has, has a lot to do with the piece. You know, whatever. Well, that was doing. one of my questions is how does the material influence the end product of what you're making? whether it's the size or whether or not you color it or. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. You know, and again, it's that starting with an idea and then going forward with it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is so much fun because you, you can change your mind. You can go in a different direction um, mm -hmm. or you can add ideas and you can add things to it. That's why I have all those jars of stuff in my studio so that Gosh, it really needs something. Oh, this will work. Go grab it and put it in there. So do you just pick up things along the way? I heard you talk about like a yard sale or a flea market and that kind of thing. Oh, just, yes. That's all you do. Okay. Yep. I do that. And then people give me things. Oh, really? <laughs> well, that's really good. strange. I bet you would like this. I mean, I've gotten a typewriter and a clock and you can take them apart and use pieces. It's really fun. 
I can see uh, people now at their homes. What are we going to do with this deer? I don't know. Let's give it to Peggy. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. I have people that do that. It's like they want to get it out of their garage. They give it to me. It's fabulous. I love it. So if you've got anything you don't want, call me. <laughs> careful. careful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I better be careful about that. No, don't just send me anything. Okay. Unless, of course, you have a Montezuma uh, pine needle tree in your house in your yard or something you have a montezuma pine what is, is that, that you've mentioned it a couple times i've never heard of that is that in uh, your area there's all different kinds of pine trees right and they have different length of needles uh different amount of needles in their shaft and i have a lot of canary pines around me and uh -huh. then south of me there's some tory pines and they're all they're all different but the um the montezuma pines are not native to my area. They're really admit, uh, native to central, say Mexico, and they're up at a high altitude and they're really big, big trees. So you don't see them around that much around houses and you know, residential neighborhoods, they're just too big, but they have really long pine needles <laughs> and the longer the better, and they're really nice. So if you have one in your yard or you know of where one is, <laughs> Contact me on my website. <laughs> that was Catherine Erickson's question. There you go, Catherine. Oh, that surprises me. I'm from Georgia. You know, our, our pine needles are you know, like this long. So yeah, some are. But I didn't realize they were that long. Ones. Yeah, there's some really good ones in Florida. I've got some really, every place I go, oh, really? I look. Yes. I don't know what kind they are, but they're really pretty. I'm, I'm going to Florida soon. If I bring you a bunch, will you, you name something <laughs> after me, you know? I don't know. I'm pretty. I'm pretty picky. I actually pick them up one at a time or take them off the tree. Do <laughs> you really? Oh my god! Yes. You can't just go get a big mound. You know, trees. There's a big mound of pine needles. No, those are those are too messed up. You want you want ones of the places where I have my secret places where I I know when the gardener comes. I come right before him. <laughs> so well, do you anything, take them out of the tree, or you wait until they fall? Sometimes you can take them out of the tree. They're dry. Oh, okay. And so you can take the pine needles out of the tree. And sometimes they're on the bushes or on the ground underneath, but you don't want them to be there too long because they might get stepped on or brittle or moldy. So if I know the gardener, you know, has come, he's gotten rid of those, and now it's right before he's going to come again, that's a great time to go and pick them up off the ground. Uh -huh. And if they're broken or something, I don't pick them up. Or I have also followed the tree trimmers in um, my city tree trimmers when they're trimming um, canary pines mm -hmm. and they think I'm really strange when I pull up and ask if I could have some branches <laughs> and I'm loading in my car and they're looking at me like I'm crazy but I can do that too because when they're green I can take them home and dry them out I you know can hang them outside and just let them dry naturally there you go yeah Except the one time I did hang them, I hung them from the eaves of my house. And I think I disturbed my neighbors because I think they thought I was launching into some kind of cult or something, but it was, I was just drying my pine needle. The basketry cult? Yes, the basketry cult. You can yeah. always tell those basketry people, they're looking on the ground for stuff <laughs> to pick up. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. If you weren't doing basketry, what would you do? What would be your art form? Because you've tried several, but would you go to something new or would you? I think I'd cry. I just, you, you just have to understand. I really, really, I, I don't know what it is about basketry, okay. but and, I just love it. Okay. <laughs> okay, if you could have all the time and money to your disposal and all the pine needles that you wanted, <laughs> <laughs> what would be a really good project, your dream project that you would like to do? Oh, my gosh. Gosh, I, that's a hard one. I don't know. I have so many ideas in my well, head. Well, that's what I was thinking. You have, to, you have so many that it would probably be hard to choose. It really is. And the, and the thing is, I, I used to make little sketches and things of my ideas, and I still do. But I don't look at those that often because a lot of times when I'm working in my studios, when I get my creative ideas, and then that takes precedence over, you know, the one that I thought of before. 
I don't know. I think it would be, I think there's things that I've made that I think would look interesting if they were all together. Like the two dresses that I made, it would be interesting in a small space if all these dresses were hanging around. That would be kind yeah. of fun. Uh -huh. Yeah. Or maybe making something with other people. That would be fun. Uh, you know, putting them together. Because I have done that. And um, it, it's fun. It's, it's interesting. I have, uh, there's a group of us, there's four of us. And we're all artists, not necessarily fiber artists. But we pick a word about every two months we get together and we pick a word. And then we make something based on that word. But we don't share our ideas there. And then we come back and show what we made. Oh, how fun. Yeah, and it's really fun and it's really interesting because even though you have the same word, it's just everybody interpreted it completely differently. And um, I know we even had a, a show. We picked 10 words and showed them in a gallery. And they were very interesting together. Um, you know, seeing them together, the same word, only very different and with different uh, techniques uh, and not all fiber. So that, that, was, that was fun. And the, also the response we got from the people that came to the opening, it was interesting because they said, well, you're all different, but they go together. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know how that happened, but it did. It was, it was very interesting. And I'm also in a group called California Fibers. And I love that because it's not that all basket makers are all one thing. I mean, we have weavers and felters and tapestry weavers and people that um, paint on silk or shibori and weaving, hand loom, you know, any kind of loom weaving. And it's so interesting to see what every, what other people are making. To me, that's very uh, stimulating. You get a lot of ideas from seeing what people mm -hmm. are, other people are doing, and sharing, and you know their information with me and with other people. It's great. Well, I was thinking about your inspiration because that's one of the questions I want to ask you. So that in itself sounds like some kind of an inspiration to get you going. But who are some of the people that you think have inspired you, uh, past and present? <laughs> that's a terrible question I'm sorry because <laughs> I'm going to make like three or four friends and everyone else is going to hate me because I didn't mention them we could do but, the old teacher thing was there a teacher? <laughs> <laughs> well um, I think one person it's kind of strange but that she was not a fiber artist or anything she was my first grade teacher and um, <laughs> no she did inspire me in that she had this gift and in her classroom, she found one thing that every child could excel at. Found one thing kind of special about every one of her students. And she nurtured that and she, she you know, made that important to you. And she gave you that confidence that you could do it and that you were special. And that's an amazing gift to give mm -hmm. to someone. And she did it to every child in her in that class and all the ones before I was there and all the ones after. So Mrs. Grimm, first grade teacher, she was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was great. And then I'd have to say, um, obviously, when I took my first basket class, that definitely inspired me and got me going because, like I said, I found out what I wanted to do. I wanted to make baskets. And that teacher, she was making a pine needle basket. And I saw this little teeny ad in the paper that there was gonna be this basketry class. And it was three lines, it didn't have a picture or anything, but there was gonna be this basketry class on Saturday at this museum near me. I thought, why not? Cause I've always loved baskets. I've sold baskets, I collected baskets. And so the idea, but the, I never thought of making one. So I went and took the class with Nadine Spear and I was hooked. Well, some people were asking about um, your tools. They said, you know, they know, well, first of all, somebody was asking about um, how do you take care of your hands? Cause you use your hands so much, right? I do, I how do. do you, what do you do to take care of your hands? That was from Mary Ann Stanton. Well, <laughs> they're still here, but uh... 
I actually, I try and take a break. And when I'm working in my studio, I try and take a break. I set a little timer and in an hour, I just get up and you, know, you can do little hand exercises and just get up, get off, you know, get off your chair, walk around, do something and just take a, a little bit of break. Mm -hmm. And I know friends of mine have had, you know, hand problems and serious hand problems. So I'm just kind of sitting here hoping I don't get those. Right, so, right. Yeah, because I, I don't want to give it up. But but I think if you, you know, if you take a break and you and you're aware of it, but that's really what I try to do. But I don't have any magic solution to that problem because it is a problem with anybody that does any kind of art. Yeah, any kind of repetitive. Yeah. Well, actually, that was from Kathy Stark. Sorry, Kathy. Um, but what what are the other tools that you need to do bass What else are you using, like awls or? I don't know. Well, my my tools are really simple. I'm lucky because I'm using pine needles, and I use pine needles dry. I do not soak them. Uh huh. So all I need, I have a basket, and in the basket, I'll put my pine needles. I have them, you know, ready to go and wrapped up. Um, I'll put my thread, which again is um, wax linen or ply thread, whatever color I want, because it comes in lots of different colors. And then if I'm using anything else, you know, like rope or string or, or rag cordage or anything, I'll have that in there too. And then I don't need that much else. I need some scissors and some needles. Oh, very um, sophisticated tools like maybe clothespins, <laughs> um, just that, you know, I don't need a lot of things and mm -hmm. I don't need a lot of room. Now I have other tools for other things, obviously, but, and I use need awls once in a while or a special kind of needle to get through something, but it's, it's neat because I don't need that much. And so, especially if it's a smaller um, piece of art, if I'm traveling and I do a lot with my family and my husband, um, I'll take it with me because it's small, I can. So usually when I'm on vacation, my husband likes to sleep late and I'm up making a basket. <laughs> so it works out perfectly. So I don't need those many. You know, doing sculpting on, on big stones or something while he's sleeping. It's a quiet thing. You can do that. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, somebody. Or when he's sleeping too. <laughs> Um, I'm going to ask some more of these questions. I love that. This is from Mary Boyd. I love this. Do you find that sometimes you're fighting with the piece, not just a dialogue, but a fight? And does the typical piece, does typically the piece win? <laughs> yes, I've had that happen. And I have let that piece know in no uncertain terms how <laughs> upset I am. <laughs> and sometimes I, oh, it'll keep me up at night or something. I'm so mad. It's just not going the way I want it. But, you know, usually I just put it away up the well and, and you know, the next day it's fine. But yes, you know, that I know those pieces have minds of their own and some of them are out to get you. You have to fight back. <laughs> Okay, uh, Katrina asks, absolutely beautiful and inspiring. Um, how do you work as in flat or on a table that you can get around it? She said it's a weird question because she's sure it's all relative, but she was just wondering how do you have your studio set up so you can get to your piece? Right, um, well, I have a table and a chair and, um, but a lot of things, like I said, if they're small, a lot of times I'm weaving it in my lap. So, you know, in my lap, I can weave it. Really? Or if it's a little large, it's a table. Or if it was like that first dress I made, or if it's something that's bigger than me, then it's got to be on the table. Oh, okay. Or sometimes I put it, oh, the one dress that you showed, it, it you know, got to the point, it, it couldn't be lying on the table. So I had to, I think I took a piano stool or something and then put it on it so I could work on the bottom. Um, so you just use what you have but again it's nothing it's nothing elaborate um or sometimes i'll even hang it and work on it that way uh if it's bigger but i can work on my lap i can work on a table it just it really depends on the piece and i think it depends on how large it is 
and also what you're working with. Oh, okay. Well, speaking of large, several people have asked, what is the largest piece you've ever done in the smallest? Hmm. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. I've probably done one. My dress was one of the larger ones. I've, I've done one that maybe is like seven feet, but it's long and narrow. And again, it's pieces. So it's a hand holding all this chain coming down. Um, so they and, were separate pieces that you put together to make the final? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then I've had even things that are one that are also one piece mm -hmm. that have been quite long. I'd say, you know, six feet, seven feet in that category. Um, and the smallest, I don't know, about maybe the size of your fist or, or a little smaller. Uh -huh. Um but you know, small is hard to make. I would think, yeah. Oh, uh, it's small is, I, I'm amazed at people that make small things. <laughs> <laughs> they should get a medal because it's really, really hard to make something small, I think. Um, were there basketry traditions from other countries or culture that particularly inspire you? That's from Debbie Stringer. Um, and also, uh, can you talk some about your hats? Do because they came from other countries behind you, right? Yes, they did. Okay. Um, okay, I've had the what was the uh, first part was that other countries expire, inspire you. I mean, yeah, other definitely. Um, other countries and also other places in the United States mm -hmm. have inspired me because I love going to up and coming countries and looking at their art and enjoying the process that they're using and what they're making. And I think of basketry, again, it has a lot to do, what you're making has a lot to do with what's in your area, what you have to make it with, you know, because you're not gonna right. travel, right. And in a lot of places, you're not gonna to go to the store to buy, buy it, you, you got what you got and that's what you're using. And what I find it's so interesting is that I've gone to Africa and Asia and, and then gone to Indonesia and, and actually seeing, seeing almost the same basket. I mean, not literally the same basket, but you know, some baskets you can look at and you think, oh, well, this is from here, or this is from there, but really been thrown for a loop of where it was made. And it was like all those little basket makers way back when started in one place, <laughs> shared all their ideas and took off for greener pastures. I don't know, but they seem to all have something in, in common <laughs> that way. And they're all making such interesting things like the hats and back of me. You know, they're all made with, well, most of them, I can't see them, uh, natural materials and um, they're woven in different ways. And I just started collecting hats. I have this thing, I am a material girl. And I see these things, they're so pretty. I wanna bring them back, you know, and show them to my fellow basket makers and fiber artists and everything, so. I just, I think they're really interesting. Plus you can take them off the wall and wear them if you feel like. <laughs> well, several people are asking about dyeing. Um, the kind of dye you use, how do you dye the um, pine needles? If you wanna talk a little bit about that. Okay, mostly I do not dye pine needles. Okay. I am, I'm not a pine needle, needle dyer. I use them, again, they dry and different kinds of pine needles have different looks or different time of year you, you pick them, they look different. Oh. Or they're different browns or toward red or anything. And I usually mix different kinds of pine needles together to get different colors. But I don't usually dye mine, but a lot of people do dye them. And I do have piles of pine needles that are dyed that people have given me. And I haven't used a lot of them yet, but I, ha I have, I've been thinking of some plans to use them. But people do dye pine needles and gosh, I'm, I'm just not a real uh, 
expert on that because I haven't done it, but it's something about a big pot on the stove and glycerin and everything. And then I've had um, some basket makers over to my house and we've made a basket out of reed or, or whatever. And they have you dye it with writ dye. You're really? Like, writ? Yes. I had never seen that before. And it's like my house we're having a class and goes, yeah, you could dye these with dye. Oh, really? So of course we all ran out and got some dye, put it in a big barrel and then it's dumped our basket. It was interesting. It gave it a, a certain look. And I know I made one that it had um, black pieces in it and then the, the natural whites. And then I think I dyed it red and then it was red, black. But it's interesting. It was just writ dye. And I know some other people, you can use tea now that you're talking about tea, you know, <laughs> tea, tea dyes. And yeah, things yeah. Like that you can use. I've had people, they made dyes out of leaves and things. And, and of course, there's indigo dye. There's a lot, so many different kinds. It's interesting when people, to me, when people start talking about dyes, because that's a whole nother thing, you know, natural dyes, commercial dyes. Pretty interesting what you can do. Yeah, I think you mentioned it, but somebody else asked about glycerin. You use glycerin for what? I think, okay, this is what my understanding is, is when you're, you're dyeing these pine needles, for some reason you, you, can, you can also put glycerin in them. I don't know if it's to set the dye. I also know that some people put just regular pine needles, they're not dyeing them, they put them in glycerin. So I may be wrong about that glycerin. Do you one. use it? Do you use glycerin? I don't use glycerin, no. Oh, okay. Right. But glyc if you put your pine needles in glycerin, they will be much more supple. They will, they will oh, not okay. be, but then they won't smell like pine needles either. So oh. I, I think know. that's what she was asking about is what do you, you know, if you do that. Yeah, but, but that's, and I'm, again, I'm not quite sure how, how they do it, but I think it's in like a, you know, boiling pot of something with uh -huh. glycerin in it. But I'm sure you could find it out from anybody in a basketry guild. And one, one wonderful thing about the textile artists that I've come across with is they're always sharing their ideas. Yes. And so if you want to know something, you ask and they'll tell you. They're, they're not hiding anything. They're just, and I think that makes it really nice. They're just sharing all their ideas or what they can do. Uh-huh. So. Um, several people asked about the waxed linen. Mm -hmm. Where you get it and what you use it for. Okay. Think of it as a needle and thread. I'm, I'm basically got my bundle of pine needles and I'm, you know, sewing them <laughs> together basically. So um, it's a thread. Uh, it's a linen thread, but it's been, it's been basically uh, woven together. So, you know, you, instead of really thin, you have two ply, three ply, you can get to six or 12 ply of all the, the pieces of string that have put, been put together, you know, to make this thread. And then they, it's got a layer of um, wax on it, mm -hmm. which makes it one really strong when you, oh, you know, okay. you're pulling it. Um, because they always have this um, joke that, you know, you can always tell a coiler because they pull too hard they're making a different, another basket. <laughs> but, um, so it's really wonderful to work with because it has a little bit of wax on it. When you're pulling it and you're putting it in place, it tends to stay because it, you know, it's got that. The other really nice thing about it is when you're finished with the basket, you can just take your hairdryer and just, just take the hairdryer and warm up the whole basket. And basically that layer of wax that's on that, and, you know, you, oh. you kind of scraped it through the pine needles or what you're working on and you've had it in your hands, but you, you put that hairdryer on it and it, uh -huh. it's almost like it pops the color of that wax. It just, I don't know. And I, I think between the, the, well, maybe the oil on your hands and the wax on the linen and everything, it just kind of seems to brighten up the whole thing. Well, here's a kind of a shift. Uh, Nancy um, had a, uh, Everham had a great question, which is how long did it take you before you felt comfortable what you were doing and had some confidence in it and, you know, saw yourself as an artist too? Or did you have it from the get-go? 
Um, I didn't have it from the get go by any uh -huh. means. You know, nobody liked me when I was a little kid. They wouldn't let me color in their color books because I went outside the lines. <laughs> so I never got it from the get go, believe me. But um, I, I don't think you have to totally get it to do it because it's, it's a journey. You know, yeah. I, look, I look at my first basket. It, you know, the fact that I made that basket and got so excited about baskets and had to do it from looking at that basket, <laughs> I think I was insane. And people come in my, you know, I see people, oh, this is my first basket and it's big and beautiful and mine is like scruffy and broken pine needles. It's terrible. I doubt that. I but doubt the thing that. is, there's just something about it. You, you know, you liked it. And so you just keep, you just keep trying, you keep um, going along. And I know I, I'm always trying to improve my craftsmanship and, 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 and learn things from other people and get little hints here and there and um, just try and do my best. And I think too, as artists, I think we're the hardest on ourselves. Yeah. So, you know, we make something and we go, oh yeah, there's a scoop right there. And one person I know told me in a class, because when you're in a class, you also learn from all the people in the class, you know, just, just keep going. You know, once the thing's finished, you'll never be able to find that mistake. And that's sometimes true, or sometimes it's yeah. just hitting you in the face, but nobody else notices it. It's really not anything to worry about. And I think we just need to forgive ourselves and it's not perfect and just keep going and maybe try more on the other one to get where you want to be. And and it's really not that you're you're failing or anything. You just made maybe you made a few mistakes, but we learn by our mistakes, so could be a good thing. Well, talking about being an artist, somebody else was asking, do you um, do you do commissions? You know, have you had corporates come to you and say we need a piece for this building, kind of thing? No, I don't. Okay. Um, and. <sighs> I wish I did. I, I have a lot of friends that um, do do commissions and they do very well. And they and they all seem to have a not, I know, routine would be the wrong word, but something that, that they go through that makes them feel comfortable with it. You know, like talking to the person they're making it with, letting them be a part of the, the process as far as maybe choosing, I don't know, color or what it's with or size or that kind of thing. And, and they do really well and they enjoy it a lot. I don't way back when, when I was a painter, somebody wanted me to paint this, this picture of this thing. And, and I really wanted to do it for it because she had bought another piece from me that I'd already made, but I, I just couldn't do it. Huh. I just couldn't do what she wanted. And I, I think it's probably the way I work because I changed my mind and I, and I want to go right instead of left. And if I go left, they're not going to like it. And if I go their way, I'm not going to like it. And, you know, I would just, I'm selfish. I want to do it the way I want to do it. <laughs> and if they like it afterwards, they can have it. Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> well, so, um, BP asks, what do you do when you have a lull in your creative energy? You know, we're always on task with life events and does that leave space in your brain in your life to be creative? You know, has that happened to you? And did you find a way to kind of deal with that and get back from it? Um, I don't have that problem a lot because I have so many ideas. I do have sometimes when life gets in the way <laughs> and you know, you can't really get in your studio as much as you'd like and um, which, you know, I like to get in my studio every day if I can. And sometimes you're busy, but even if you're just an hour in there, I think it just, I don't know, calms me down, makes me feel good and everything mm -hmm. and gets me going. Um, but I haven't had that much, you know, time where I've said, well, now what do I make? It's, it's, it's almost like my brain has too much going on in it. My friend Mary asked me one time if, if I had an off button <laughs> we <don't>. hope not <laughs> we hope not <laughs> you might if you were around me enough <laughs> Pam Chumbly said um, that you're wearing some of the colors um, that was in that dress and she was wondering do you 
have a palette that you you find that you use like to use the same colors when you do use color? Um, probably not. I have a drawer full of wax linen and all different kinds of colors. Um, I use black a lot, but um, you know that coats with everything. But I would say for the most part, no. I think it depends on what I'm making. Maybe that the what I'm making is suggesting the color that I use, and you know you can you can choose pick and choose what you want to use as far as color. So it's just what goes with it. It's what I think. Right. And like this, this one, you know, it's got a lot of different colors in it. But that was part of the thing. I thought, well, this is interesting because they're all different, and yet they go together and. There's a lot of different colors in there. It does Although, match your shirt perfectly. <laughs> it was. Although a good I don't question. see, I don't see any green. Green is. Missing. There you go. See, I missed one there. There you go. Okay. But I don't have favorite colors that much. I I really like color. Period. Um, they were asking where do you get um, the wax linen fiber. You can get it at uh, um, quite a few different places. I've even seen some at craft stores. Personally, I get mine from um, Royal Wood. Yeah. Of Royal Wood. It's on- We the love East. Royal Wood. Yes, definitely love Royal Wood. I love it when I go to conventions and things and Royal Wood is there with all their stuff. I, I leave a lot of money at Royal Wood because they always have great things to look at and lots of colors on wax linen that are new or something so oh, that, it comes in colors yeah it comes oh, i didn't know that what i didn't know that i've learned something new today oh, oh yeah no it, it comes they have everything i mean they have you know white and black they have a, a butterscotch color that's very natural and a yellow they have greens they have yeah they have purple they have red different shades of red and different shades of blue like that piece in back of your head. They probably have every one of well, those colors. There you go. There you yeah. go. Yeah. And yeah. not only do they have all the different colors, but then they have, you know, two ply, three ply, it goes up. Mm -hmm. So depending on what you were working on, you can get different thicknesses too, which is great. And I never have a problem, it seems, with any of the wax linen I get there. Good. It's all really good quality, I think. Um, are you teaching at all on, online or anywhere? No, I really don't teach. I've been a teacher in my working life, but um, I really don't because I'm coiling and there's people in, in my area that teach coiling and I feel like I kind of be stepping on their toes by teaching coiling. And that's really all I'm doing is coiling. <laughs> that's it. Simple. It's just um, crazy, that's it, that's it. Well, I know you're entering in exhibits. We've seen several of your pieces in the Ham Weavers Guild of America exhibits. They're just amazing. So do that's you- It's always fun to enter. <laughs> that was my question. Is that an important part of your process? Do you feel like that keeps you going to enter exhibits? Um. I don't know that if it, it keeps me going because again, I just like the make the making, but you okay. realize you get to a point in your making, you realize it's getting a little crowded in that studio and you need to get rid of some of this stuff. And um, so, you know, take, putting it out there that way and, and entering these different, um, you know, possibilities to show your work someplace can, it can be frustrating, but it can also be very satisfying and it does get your work out there. And I think as fiber artists, it's important that we put our work out there for other people to see, because it is something that other people can do. And it's kind of passing on that tradition to other people. And I found that by entering the, the shows and things, a lot, some of them you, know, you can actually sell your work and some not, but I, I've sold pieces that way. And when I first started doing the basketry, my son was in, grammar school so it wasn't like I could go out and you know 
go to a, a venue, you know, one of those fine venues where everyone's selling their different art pieces. So that was the only way I could get stuff out there. And that's mostly what I still do now. Huh. Um, so people were asking about pricing. How do you go about pricing to sell? <laughs> I know that's tough. It is really difficult. That is yeah. such a difficult thing. Um, that was from Lucy Moon. Thank you, Lucy. Yeah, thanks a lot, Lucy. I don't have a good answer. You know, I think that's one of the hardest things. And I've noticed, like, when I was first starting, I kept asking people, well, how do you price this? How do you price this? And they look at me like, and, and now I look at them the same way when they ask me. I think it's, I think it's really hard. Um, I think it's hard because, you know, you need to look at that objectively, and yet you're not because you're part of that work, and it's, it's hard to, to do it that way. And... And like I said, I, I kind of keep this little, um, not a clock timer next to me to, to make myself get up, you know, and, and go every hour. So I, I do know how long it's taken me to make and that can have, um, that definitely would probably have, well, it does have some uh, influence on a pricing. And mm -hmm. sometimes, um, you know, if I add that up and everything, I think, ah, oh, no, that's too expensive or no, it's, it's, it's just really hard sometimes. And it's, I think it's hard to get information about pricing your work from other people too, because- Okay, I have a question. It is. Don't, don't tell me about it, I asked you this, but do you ever price something really high so it won't sell? Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> because that's a thing that I think is so funny. I mean, I've had things that are very high priced and they sell. And I have something I think I'm practically giving away and no one wants it. <laughs> so I don't know what it is. I, I think maybe people buy art like I do. I, if I see something that just really hits me and I really like it, and I love buying art you know, from people that I know or I've met the artist or I've met, got to know them from a group or something or I meet them at a conference. So I kind of buy art based on how I feel about it. And I think a lot of other people do too. But yeah, it's interesting. You, could, you, you can do that. And you know, sometimes when you're in a show or whatever, they're going to take part of your, your, mm -hmm. your money from you. So a lot, I, probably a lot of people have done that. I don't usually do that, but, but I'm not, I'm not in a position right now that I'm, I'm counting on my art to eat. Okay. Yeah, because I like eating. And if I had to bet that price up there to eat. <laughs> Was there a time in your life where your art did support you financially? Um, partly, but not completely, I would okay. say. <clears throat> now I kind of, you know, if I, I sell something, kind of put the money away. <laughs> So if I go on a trip, I can buy some art or whatever. But um, yeah, so it's neat. It's fun. Well, we have had a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much for coming well, on thank today. You. I really do appreciate you coming mm -hmm. today. Well, I had fun. I was really nervous at first, but I had fun. So thank you so much. It was fun and it was an honor. And I plan on watching the rest of the shows because I watched the first one and I really learned a lot. So keep it up. <laughs> We've posted your website, which is um, in the notes. And then I believe the website's up right now on the screen. So if you want to see more of her gorgeous and varied and exciting work, can you tell I'm a fan? Um, please go to PeggyWiedemann.com and see more of her work. Um, you can, again, I want to thank Laurel Schwartz for sponsoring the session today. Again, go to her website. There it is. She has beautiful wow. um, handmade um, jewelry. And so go check out what um, she has to offer. And again, thank you, Laurel Schwartz, for your um, support today. And remember, membership has its benefits. So if you like what you're seeing today and you want to support HGA, come join us. You can join by going to wespendie.org. 
Um, we would love to have you be part of HGA. Um, this program is generously supported by donations through the Fiber Trust. Uh, you can donate through weavespindie.org also. Um, like I said, it supports these programs and many more. Uh, one of those being that tomorrow uh, you can see the um, jurors talk um, by Kathleen Wilson, and that's tomorrow afternoon, 1 Eastern Standard Time. Um, I'm excited because next week on January 19th, I'll be having tea with Janet Phillips all the way from England. We'll see how well I do the English tea thing. Uh, Janet is a wonderful weaver and her second book has just been published. She'll talk some about that. And that session is gonna be sponsored by Made in America Yarns. If you're interested in being a sponsor for Tea and Textiles, please contact us at weavespindye.org. Um, some people have mentioned that they missed some of this program or if you just wanna see it again, it was recorded on Facebook. Uh, you can go to Facebook at the HGA Facebook spot and you can watch it again. Uh, later, it will be on um, the HGA YouTube channel, YouTube channel. So again, thank you all so much. Thank you, Peggy. Oh, Have a thank great you. afternoon. You all enjoy your rest of your day. Happy tea. <laughs> thank you.